Welcome to the first in our four-part series on how to accurately measure nanosecond scale networks. I'm Dr. Matthew Grosvenor, and I'm speaking on behalf of the team at Exablaze. In this first part, we're going to look at quantifying measurement precision and accuracy using a range of network capture devices. And the idea here is to try and establish a bound on the quality of the measurement that we're going to be taking later. As I go through this presentation, I'm going to be highlighting gotchas, things that may take you by surprise while doing this sort of measurement, and tips, some suggestions on how you might want to improve your measurements in the future. The essential question that we're trying to answer here is, how do you measure nanosecond scale network devices? And the obvious answer is to use some sort of a network capture device. Now, when you buy a network capture device, the manufacturers will usually quote the measurement resolution or precision. What we have in the lab here is a collection of devices by a range of well-known manufacturers, and you can see that the measurement precision is in the region of about 10 nanoseconds. The Exablaze device, the Exonic X10, has a resolution of 6.2 nanoseconds. Now, as I go through this presentation, I'm going to be using a running example of a nanosecond scale network device. This device was released with a performance metric of 42 nanoseconds. But when you look into the details of how that measurement was taken, you'll find that it was done using a 8 nanosecond resolution capture device. What's interesting about this is it means that there is about a 40% error margin with that kind of measurement. Now this may seem like a problem, and I certainly think that it is, but what I'm going to argue in this first part is that there's an even bigger problem, which is the measurement repeatability or accuracy, and this can have a fairly dramatic impact on the quality of the measurements that are taken using these sorts of devices. In order to test this, what we'll need is some sort of a measurement rig or platform that we can use to establish what the error bounds are going to be. So what I have on the slide here is a fairly straightforward setup. I have a source that's generating some packets. Those packets get fed into an optical splitter, and the optical splitter then sends both packets to one of our capture devices. The theory is that both packets will arrive at precisely the same time, and that the capture device will capture both of those packets. And so now what we can do is measure the difference in the timestamps that the capture device reports and get in a sense of the error bound. So what I've done here is take device A. It has a resolution of 7.5 nanoseconds, and I've put 10 million samples through just that sort of setup. As I go through, I'm going to report my errors using an error distribution that looks a little bit like this. So on the x-axis, what we have is the error or the uh, value reported by, by the capture device. And on the y-axis, what we have is the number of samples that, that had that value. So getting closer to zero is better and getting more samples at zero is better. With device A, what we get is the following. You can see this curve has some interesting features. The first is that we have a value right down there at negative 15 nanoseconds. Now remember that this was a 7.5 nanosecond resolution device. And the first gotcha here to be aware of is that the measurement precision or resolution is not always equal to the error bound or the accuracy here. So it is possible to get a negative 15 nanosecond value out of a 7.5 nanosecond resolution device. The other interesting thing to observe here is that you can see we have this sort of quantization going on. What I've done is enlarge those buckets so you can see them next to each other there. And they're kind of hovering around 7.5 nanoseconds, but in actual fact there's one at minus 8 nanoseconds and one at minus 7 nanoseconds. And this is kind of a second gotcha for doing this kind of high precision measurement, which is that the measurement precision is not always equal to the reporting precision. So in this case, the device reports values in 1 nanosecond increments, but it actually takes samples in 7.5 nanosecond increments, and obviously 7.5 is not evenly divisible by 1. So we can clean this up and round to the nearest uh, resolution increment of the device, and this is the sort of curve that we get coming out. Now this is not unique to the device A. Using device B you get very much the same sort of thing. So device B again, 4 nanosecond resolution device, 10 million samples, and if we run that we get very much the same sorts of effects. Again we get a negative 8 bucket on and a positive 8 bucket on the uh, measurement. So again we have the same gotcha number one, which is that the measurement precision is not equal to the error bound. And on this particular device, you can see it has a very uh, large quantization error. There are four buckets there, and that's because of the way that this device reports its values as a sort of a binary fraction. And so once again, four nanoseconds is not representable evenly uh, as the in the reporting precision. So 
the kind of summary of this is a, is a tip, which is to avoid quantization errors when you do this sort of measurement, you really need to round to the nearest multiple of the clock period. Now, if I take device B and I clean it up, I get this sort of fairly sensible looking curve. You can see that um, there is a little bit of skew off to one side. Um, and if we wanted to sort of try and summarize the data in here, we might want to try and take an average. And that average comes out at about 1.24 nanoseconds. So that's sort of the average skew the device is reporting. Now, what I want to warn is to be a little bit careful with that sort of value. If I take device C, which has got a 7.5 nanosecond resolution, and I take 10 million samples, I get an average that's pretty close on to zero, which looks pretty good, which, which is great until we sort of open it up and have a look at the curve. And you see here that out of 10 million samples, not a single one actually landed on zero we were expected to, to land. And even worse, there was a 37.5 nanosecond uh, spread between the, the minimum and the maximum value. Now that's quite a serious deviation and I have a ticket open with the manufacturer of this device. Um, it's been open for several months now and they've not been able to resolve it for me. Every single time I run this experiment I get exactly that result so I'm not really sure what to do about that. I guess we'll just have to leave it with them and be, be warned to avoid device C in your measurements. Putting that in context, if we took our 42 nanosecond device plus or minus eight nanoseconds and replaced it with the 37 nanosecond spread that we're seeing, what we end up is a 42 nanosecond device plus or minus 18.75. So that 40% error margin blows out to be a 90% error margin. And so what I wanted to sort of conclude here is that the accuracy matters absolutely more than the resolution. Now obviously it would be remiss not to include our XNIC device. So we have our XNIC X10. Again, the same exact experimental setup, 6.2 nanosecond resolution, 10 million samples. And the results come out looking actually pretty good. Now, what I want to point out here is that these are the raw results. There's no cleaning or smoothing involved in this. The average is pretty much spot on. And we have just two buckets, one either side. And that's just sort of coincidental to the way the device works internally. Um, but very good results that we can use in measurements going forwards. So if you remember tip number one, which was to round to the nearest multiple of the clock period, in this particular case, it's actually not quite so straightforward. What you need to do is round to the nearest multiple or use a device or format that conveys the full precision, which is exactly what the Exonic does. And the second sort of obvious tip from all of this is that you need to really calibrate first. Make sure that you have an idea of what your devices are doing first before you attempt to do any kind of measurement with them. So to try and quantify the accuracy that we're seeing of these devices, it would be nice to sort of sort of find some way to summarize all of these curves. I did look at using the average, but we saw that didn't work very well. Uh, an alternative approach might be to use the range, perhaps, or pe maybe half of the range. That's uh, not an ideal situation either, because it sort of penalizes devices that have a wide range, but not very many samples out there. What we again want to do is sort of give some sort of weight to things that are closer to zero, uh, which is better, and more values at zero. So one suggestion I have for doing this is to use the standard deviation. Standard deviation has this kind of complicated looking formula, but it's actually quite easy to apply. Uh, it's actually not quite the right thing to use in this situation because it sort of tends to favor normal distributions, which is not exactly what we have, but it's actually pretty close. So what I often do is instead of just representing the standard deviation value, which I have here, is that I go for plus or minus uh, a standard deviation, so in effect two standard deviations from the mean. And that gives us a very good sense of what the error bound is that we can expect on the devices that we're using. As you can see, the XNIC X10 has a very good looking standard deviation there, probably about twice as good as any other value on, on that slide. Now, with that, I'm going to actually end this part and... What we're going to do in the next part is look at an, another Exonic device, which is called the Exonic HPT. Uh, and this device has really stellar performance when it comes to resolution and accuracy. So join me next part for part two in our discussion on nanosecond scale network measurement.